I was horrendous. I was slower than I was in middle school. I'm like, you know, maybe I won't come back. And then at the end of the year, all my time started to get really pretty fast again. Not really fast, but I almost made state. And it was just hard. So fast forward to like, you know, the next fall, I'm, I'm, I trained all off season by myself. Just like the scorching heat of the Iowa summer to the blistering cold of the Iowa winter. Um, I shoveled a lane out of the track and I'm, I'm going on school lunch just to go do like workouts out there in the snow. Welcome to the Talking Shop Podcast, where I'm here to share stories, lessons, and experiences in sports performance and professional development. I'm joined by Dr. Brennan Thompson of Acceleration. And how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. How about you? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Oh, it's a good day when I can record a podcast, catch up with friends. So before I open the floor, just to introduce yourself a little bit about how we know each other is Brennan tweeted out something about uh, rolling averages and sprint times is just a new way to think about kind of PRs and progress. And I just thought like uh, acute to chronic or just like a ratio. And uh, I was just trying to wrap my head around what that really looked like. So I just tweeted like, hey, what kind of formula do you use? You know, and just trying to like better picture it. And then uh, Spikes only chimed in and was like, I think this was theoretical, but you know, you can have them on your podcast. I was like, okay, interesting. You know, so I, I scrolled through your stuff and I liked what you were about. So I shot you a DM and just said, Hey man, you know, like, I'd love to have you on the pod, but I'd love to just chat with you first, you know, just see if you're a cool dude. And, uh, and I think we chatted for like an hour, 15, 15 30. Yeah. It was up there somewhere. And my phone crapped out like within <laughs> the last five minutes. That was so annoying, but, <laughs> but that's just one of the beauties of like social media and it's not shooting out DMS just to do it. But like, if you have a reason, if you vibe with someone, like just how awesome and nice people are. And, and I'm, and I'm grateful that it's worked out up to this point. So uh, that's just how we know each other. But for those who aren't familiar, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So born and raised in Iowa, lifelong athlete. Um, if, if you name a sport, I've probably done it. Uh, I mean, I've done football, basketball, baseball, soccer, tumbling, track, disc golf, uh, I used to box. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of different sports and I'd say that athletics are very central to, you know, everything I kind of value in life. And um, so did five years at Iowa, um, some of the best years of my life, uh, double majored in human phys and psychology. Um, and I was also on the track team there. And then uh, I became an All-American, moved down to St. Louis for physical therapy school opened my training business. And here I am. I just graduated from PT school back in May. Like you said, I'm doctor now, which is really weird to me a lot. (laughs) And I'm still training athletes and just opened my new clinic. So I'm really excited for, well, other than COVID, um, really excited for what the future has to hold. (laughs) So does that technically make this a doctor's appointment? Uh, Nope, we're not doing a consultation. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. So, and, uh, and Brennan puts out a lot of really awesome content sprint wise as that's kind of your background and and your forte, but just your combination of putting your DPT together with the performance thing, because I'm sure the average PT and the average performance coach would say that the the other has no idea what they do or they don't get it. So it's, it's awesome that, that you can put it all together and, and definitely fill, fill a hole that, that this field is kind of missing someone that understands really kind of all of it. So kind of very briefly, where do you think putting those two can provide way more value than just one by itself? So I think, um, well, we'll start with the performance coach. So as a performance coach, you know, we're, we're used to taking someone from where they are to where they want to be. And that might look like, you know, practice and, you know, if you're bad at free throws, you go and you say, okay, this kid's bad at free throws. We need to shoot a lot of free throws with him so he's a better free throw shooter. Uh, we need to condition. We've got to work on passing, ball handling, da 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 um, But what I feel like um, most performance coaches miss the boat on is movement in general, just, just a general high test movement. Like you can see when an athlete has, you know, they're, they're just uncoordinated or whatever, but can you really break down what's happening in each movement? And can you 
can you then take that information to help guide your programming to then help rectify whatever poor movement exists within that spectrum? Um, but then coming from a healthcare perspective, um, I think the biggest thing is that since I can dissect movement, I can also see kind of where we might see some injury risks. So for example, a sprinter who overly reaches out and he kind of claws his way down the track versus pushing his way down the track, um, you might be thinking like a hamstring issue or, uh, you know, you can see where they might have some core insufficiencies. And so you can look at the movement to then come back and give like targeted intervention. And so being able to do that with my athletes has been huge because, um, and I, I'm proud to say that I've predicted hamstring injuries, but I'm not proud in the fact that I couldn't fix them before it was too late. So I've had probably three kids that I've worked with this year who I, it, as soon as they start running, I'm like, mom and dad, like he, this is a hamstring just waiting to happen. Okay, we'll fix it. Well, you only come once a week, if that. So it's really hard for me to fix that. So then here we are a month later and they're like, yeah, can't come today. Pulled his hamstring. Uh, man, if only we could have, you know, got more sessions in so that we could have at least had a better shot. So I like the fact that I can marry the two things, you know, physical therapy is everything about performance and movement. Um, performance coaching is everything about performance and movement. It's just being able to see that one thing leads to performance and one thing can take away from from performance and then being able to marry those two is just awesome. Sounds like an, an awesome opportunity for, for athletes, but also just being in the private sector, you know, with your athletes, not having to be there, just providing so much value, you know, when, when you can make that not a, a, a selling point, but it also kind of is, it's like, Hey, we can do this PT prehab performancy thing because your boy's got a doctorate, you know? So it's, it's, it's just, it just adds so much value, mm. not only to you as a practitioner, because you have these two different lenses, but also you as, as a businessman as well. So super cool. And not to get too much into those X's and O's, but that's kind of one of your, your niches or, or big selling points. So I just wanted to, and that's not something that, that everyone has. So I just wanted to get a little, a little bit about that. So, so that was pretty cool, but we will get into it. What is the coolest story you have thus far in your career? Cool story. Um, it's definitely going to be uh, my junior year in high school when I tore my ACL and I lost all my college offers and I lost the, the most important year of high school sports when you actually get recruited. Um, and then coming back, being able to try out and become a Division One All-American, a uh, couple of school records, a couple of Big Ten medals is probably the coolest story by far that um, I've ever experienced. And just to kind of grind it out on the outside as a tryout turned into a walk on trying to compete with these scholarship guys for, I mean, five years and I was injured all the time. And just to see my hard work come to fruition <clears throat> was, was probably one of the, probably the pinnacle of my athletic career was just that whole process of going from basically a castaway to I did it just, unbelievable feeling at the university of iowa yes so so when you first got injured i guess we'll kind of go down the timeline so that junior senior year what was your what was your kind of pt training regimen looking like because this was a very fundamental time which we'll kind of get into that kind of got you into this whole pt space so kind of seeing that process firsthand could we kind of just talk about i mean obviously you were devastated you were 16 17 18 you know those were your your uh your glory days you know the very important times so kind of just going through that kind of how was your your headspace and just that whole process and did you have some good coaches <clears throat> and pts or can we just talk talk about those kind of two years yeah so um we're in practice and there's a drill going on and um things don't go according to plan i, I end up with torn acl meniscus calf muscle and mcl um, my athletic trainer runs up to me and calls me a wuss, tells me to walk it off. Uh, and I wanted to play so bad. Um, I, w I went to the doctor. He's like, hey, it's just kind of sprained. Give it two weeks. Just a sprain. It's just sprained. I'm like, okay. So he, he gives me a neoprene sleeve, and I'm waiting around two weeks. Mind you, my knee is like this big. Um, 
after two weeks, swelling came down and I played like probably four or five or six games on it. Um, I got several touchdowns. And the thing was, is that uh, our school is so small, you had to play both ways. So I would do offensive practice, which would go great. There's no, there's not a whole lot of like backpedaling and shifting and whatnot. And then we get into defense and I'd be backpedaling and doing like the W drill. And on the plant and turn, knee would tweak once a week, puff up for a couple of days, couldn't walk, couldn't practice. And then I'd probably sit out the varsity game, but then come back and play JV game just because, you know, whatever. Um, but it would do that every week. It would, you know, go back, tweak, go back, tweak. And But I was running around so fast and I was still able to make plays. It was like, is it really that bad? And it, was, it wasn't until I was in this this uh, JV game, we ran, we must have run the fullback pass to me like five times, just touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. And one time he underthrew me and it really went out on me. And I was like, I gotta go get this checked out. So I go up, I get surgery or, you know, he gives me a second opinion first. He goes, dude, you're playing with fire. You need surgery like now. Skips me ahead. And um, so I get surgery and then I'm just like bottom of the barrel. You know, my track season's probably going to be awful. Um, I don't have the opportunity to play football anymore. I've got to make that business decision that I've got to quit football. Football is probably my first love. So um, even in like middle school, I was, you know, when they're like, uh, what are some of your goals in life? It was like, I want to play D1 football and run D1 track at the University of Iowa. And football dream didn't happen. But um, what was nice is that when I got into PT, they didn't just treat my injury. They didn't just like say, okay, he's got a torn ACL. We've got to come back here. we got to do the typical protocol. There's so much like psychological nurturing that happened where, you know, I don't even know if I'm going to play sports at this point. The doctor told me I wouldn't be able to be as fast as I was prior to the knee injury. And so when I got into physical therapy, they just like, they just like helped like reignite that fire under me and help me see that maybe there is a chance. And when my progress was going up and up and up, um, the doctor saw it, PT saw it, and it just helped me kind of see things differently as well. So I ran track that year and it was awful. I was horrendous. I was slower than I was in middle school. I'm like, you know, maybe I won't come back. And then at the end of the year, all my time started to get really pretty fast again. Not really fast, but I almost made state. And it was just hard. Um, so fast forward to like, you know, the next fall, I'm, I'm, I trained all off season by myself. Just like the scorching heat of the Iowa summer to the blistering cold of the Iowa winter. Um, I shoveled a lane out of the track and I'm, I'm going on school lunch just to go do like workouts out there in the snow. And I mean, like I said, just, just going through that and just like having this mountain to climb to even have a chance to do something that I really enjoy and love was like the most humbling, but rewarding experience I think I've ever been through. That's awesome. And, and everyone's kind of story relative to performance. There's usually like three reasons why they get into it. It's either they had no coach, they had a garbage coach, or they had uh, a really good coach that kind of inspired them to get into it. So it sounds like those, those PTs were huge and they definitely had a better understanding of, of PT than the average PT, just addressing those psychological things, because that is so huge and how impactful that's been leading you literally to now in your career and your future career as well. So, so super cool story about the, the shoveling stuff off. And I totally can relate with, uh, just being in Chicago, but, uh, so, so then last kind of, uh, part we'll quickly touch on and then move on, but your boy was a walk on as well, uh, at Truman state. So not too far from where you are now, it's probably in the middle of, of where you're from in, in St. Louis. Yeah, but, I think it is. So kind of going through tryouts, was it more of like a chip on your shoulder or was it more like, I'm just grateful to be here. I'm going to run fast or kind of what was your, your mindset kind of that. And then we'll, we'll talk about your freshman year also. So the tryout process was, um, it, it, it was interesting because you get to practice with everyone who's on scholarship, you get the gear, the same gear as everyone else on the team. Um, but what you don't get is you don't get a locker. 
So you're up in like some, it's like a YMCA-esque locker room. There's a sauna in there. Uh, there was something I could weigh myself on. There was, there were some showers, but it was just a generic, real thin metal locker. Um, whereas downstairs, when you're walking by the doors, you can hear the bass booming from the stereo system. And they've got, uh, you know, the big tiger hawk in the middle of the floor. They've got uh, the name plates and all these uh, prior school record holders and people that are in the Iowa Hall of Fame and what have you. And it's just like, man, they've got this lounge. I want to be a part of that. And they, they never like made you feel like a tryout. So other than the locker, I'd say that everything else was virtually identical and that we all were afforded the same workouts. We we're all afforded um, the same fundamental coaching. And what was nice is that basically the tryout period is like, two months. So you've got two months to get into a decent position to then do a, a time trial. And based on how that time trial goes, you're either cut, your event is repurposed, or you make the team. And luckily, um, my time trial went extremely well. Um, I beat someone who had scored in the 400 in the Big Ten in my time trial, who was a pretty big deal of scholarship athlete. And I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. But then meetings were later that week. So it was like, OK, everyone knows how they did in time trials, but did they make the cut? So my roommate um, had his meeting right before mine and he comes out just head down, cut. Uh, one of my best friends down the hall had a meeting. Um, his time trials didn't go as well, but he was well rounded enough. They actually repurposed him into a, multi, uh, a decathlete, multi-event guy. So that was nice for him. And then when I went in, coach was just very, very uplifting and very uh, positive. And he seemed to have a good outlook on what he thought my future could be. And everything from there was history. That's was sweet. Nice. That's sweet. Yeah. And, um, and it, it's funny. Well, I guess uh, D2 baseball is probably a little different, but uh, I'll, I don't know if I've shared this story on, on my podcast, but so it was, it was a, a one day tryout and basically there was eight of us, there was four pitchers and I was a pitcher and there was four position players. And then we all do our tryout and, and then th the coach comes out and says, thank you everyone for coming out. We're not taking anyone, but Matt, we want to talk to you after. So then he like takes me in the dugout and he goes, so your fastball sucked. Your curveball was flat. You have baby fat on your thighs. You have round shoulders but we're going to keep you and we can cut you whenever we want. And basically I, I was like iron Mike for all my baseball guys. Like I threw right over the top and then he was like, we're going to drop you down to here. Basically you'll, you'll be our experiment for the fall. And if it doesn't work out, smell you later, you know? So basically I had to teach myself how to rethrow from down here, but it was just cool going from that. And, and it was funny because I called my parents and I was like, I made the team and they were like, why aren't you excited? Like, you don't sound excited. And I was like, I don't know. I got a lot of work to do, you know, because he just basically said I, everything sucked about me besides my changeup. Um, but going from that to like Division II College World Series in one year was just nuts. And, and you know, the whole like scholarship thing and being a walk on and man, like just, just looking back, if I, if I was a scholarship player or if I did have a, have a scholarship at that school, like I would not have worked nearly as hard. So kind of like looking back, it's like, oh man, like why am I behind the eight ball? And why do all these kids that I'm better than, you know, have money, but man, like I needed it to be that way, you know? So it's, it's cool that, that it was able to, to work out for you. And, and when you realize like, Hey, I can compete with these guys. Yeah. That's, that's super cool. So, so very cool story. Uh, did you have something else on that really quick? Uh, so I just wanted to say like, you know, just having the chip on the shoulder is it, it just changes everything about the training mindset. You know, you like if you go in with a full ride scholarship, you might feel entitled in a sense and feel like you're almost complacent with where you're at with regards to any given team or training environment or whatever. But just having to work for your respect and work for your spot and feel like you need to earn your keep, I think it just changes everything about an athlete's approach to training in general. Um, you know, I was, I was driving home on the weekends to go and work 
you know, I was driving an hour and a half back home to go and clean uh, construction trucks and detail, uh, you know, their, their company vehicles because I needed that money. I spent a lot of extra time on my academics because I needed that money. And if it weren't for all of those things, maybe I don't even have the GPA to get into PT school. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for, for having that experience. I, I think, I think I'm a better person because of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I have one similar kind of story and then we'll, we'll move on. But so at the beginning of the season, so it, it was so funny because the winter, the roster came out online over the winter break and my, my name was at the bottom with no number next to it. And me being a little naive, Matt called up coach. and I was like, Hey coach, what does this mean? You know, it's like, Oh, it means you're redshirting. I'm like, I'm, I'm like the second best freshman. It's like me and a preferred walk on that are like above the four other scholarship freshmen, but it was fine. And, and then basically I started out the season redshirting and every weekend the team traveled, I was out at the track running, doing all this stuff. And then two pitchers got hurt and then he gave me a Jersey. And then basically I played a huge role the rest of the season. And then we went all the way to the top eight, you know, in, in the country. And it's just like, if I was given a Jersey, it, even being a walk on, if I was just given a Jersey, you know, like just that set me up literally for my next four years in and out of the classroom. So it's, it's one of those things where in the moment I'm like, why is this happening? But looking back, it's like, I needed that. So it's, it's super cool that you were able to realize that yourself and, and, uh, walk on to where it's at moral of my story. So <laughs> next, next big question. What is the story most fundamental leading you to now? So basically without X, you wouldn't be here. So back to the ACL. Um, I think just going through that physical therapy experience where, uh, you know, they, they really picked me up and helped me move forward and, you know, get things moving forward with my life. Um, I remember I was, I was just finishing up PT there and I asked like, how do I work here? Like, how, how can I come in here and just be a part of this? Like, this is awesome. You know, the way that PT gave to me, I wanted to give back to the world, to somebody else. Like there's another Brendan out there somewhere with the torn ACL at the bottom of the bottom, wishing he could bounce back and just be a part of the team or just go and like pursue his dreams. And I'm like, you know, I want that to happen. So I'd say the ACL was a big part of uh, me getting into physical therapy and just like really falling in love with it. And then the other event would be uh, my junior year, or no, my senior year of high school when my best friend died in my arms while we were working together. Um, we were best friends since we were like two years old, maybe three, something like that. And he had, um, he had a heart attack while we were working and it was just us. So having gone through that and, you know, he was like one of the hardest working people I knew, extremely intelligent. Um, he was a four year starter on the basketball team. Like he, he was literally anything you could want in an athlete and, and in a student and a friend. And just having lost him, it helped me kind of um, dial in on who I think that I need to be and that you need to live each and every day to the fullest and to just never let an opportunity go to waste. So, you know, I worked so much harder and just was so much more driven and motivated to just be great just because of his absence. And I think that those two things are, you know, I'll carry those with the rest of my, or for the rest of my life. And I think that it's going to help me be great in everything that, you know, I, I set out to achieve. Speaking on the, the first part of your, your, your answer about just like, how can I get in here? And it's just having that, that mindset of just like being open and like, you know, where you want to go and like, you might not know how to get there, but just being willing to put yourself out there and ask, I think is huge. And there's so many things where it's like, I, something I've recently been saying is like, I take 1% of the credit, you know, 1% because I take action, but 90% is just like awesome people giving me their time and their insights and all of this stuff. So it, it sounds kind of like you, you have that 1% and then speaking on, on kind of the second part of your story, like I can't even imagine what, what that was like. I'm not going to try to relate, but, but just, you know, having that, that so close to you, I guess, and just being able to, to maximize, I, I guess, and, and do, do what, you know, he, he would kind of want you to do and, and keep falling out and going forward. Um, I think is, is really admirable to you of you to be able to kind of maximize, like I said, and just being so young and, 
And it sounds like you were able to kind of in time, you know, I, I obviously wasn't there, but kind of realize how to um, make the most of it going forward, trying to trying to do that, that little story justice. Yeah. You know, um, you know, you just never know when, you know, this is the last time you're going to see somebody and just understanding that they could be gone. They could be here today, gone tomorrow. And just like walking up to your parents after that happens or after your, uh, you know, you, you go to, you just appreciate holidays more. I mean, every little moment you can get with somebody, you just, just appreciate it more once you've had so many of those stripped away. And so something I've really, um, honed in on to just move forward from that. I've had a lot of loss throughout. Um, and I just like to take like the most admirable, admirable traits from each person and just say, okay, this is something that is absolutely fundamental and who they were. And these are the things that I wish I could have been. I need to try and embody those traits to keep them alive and influencing the world through me as I continue to push forward in this journey. I think that's really helped me cope a lot. Putting putting all of those pieces together, and 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 I'm sure, kind of, if if you were to ask someone like describe me as as a coach or describe me as a professional, and they would say all of those little attributes, and then you'd be able to say, oh, got that from him, got that from her, you know. So it's it's cool that you're able to kind of put all those together, and uh, and very fundamental story. So second to last big one, last story. What is the story you are most proud of thus far in your career? So a little bit of overlap, um, but I'd, I'd say the biggest one is going from, you know, healthy athlete to bottom of the barrel, like I said before, just destroyed with injuries and um, one bouncing back from the injuries to achieve something great, but two, um, the people that I encountered while I was going through those injuries and now I, I've actually become that professional so that I can kind of literally go full circle and influence athletes who are both healthy and injured along their individual journeys in sports and athletic development. And, and that's uh, going back to something that I said earlier about everyone has that one that one reason of the of the three that kind of gets them into it and then just being able to speak that language you know when, when you have that kid when you have that kid that walks in that that is like down in the dumps thinks it can't get any worse and then instead of just being that pt where it's like oh don't worry like you'll make it through like just come in twice a week and then we'll do your 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 clamshells and your bad exercises and then we'll get you back to normal but like being able to speak on like like bro i've literally been there and this is how I, this is how I tackled it. This is how I achieved it. And this is where I end up, you know, and like, we're going to get through this together. So those are two completely different conversations. And especially because most athletes that we'll work with in the private sector are a little bit younger than, you know, high level college or pros that, right. you know, just having someone that's not their parent say that I think is huge especially just like, I'm sure a lot of them have the same aspirations to play sports at Iowa. So being able to say like, I was in your shoes, I worked back, I was able to be an all American at Iowa, you know, and now we're going to have an awesome time getting you back to where you want to be. You know, so I, I, I can only imagine how impactful a conversation like that would be. Yeah, it's really rewarding to, to just be in that position at all um for an athlete to one seek you out for you know improving upon whatever they want to improve upon for me it's usually speed and power um but then for them to also be able to seek you out when they're kind of searching for you know well, where do i go from here uh i just hurt my hamstring what what do i do now what what can i do to get better and have this not happen again in the future you know rehabbing the injury is half the issue the other issue is what caused the injury. If the if the mechanical viruses are still present, then the chances of that injury coming back on, um, you know, soft tissue that is only 98% of what it used to be, it's probably going to happen again, especially if you're doing the exact same training you're already doing, the, you're loading the exact same you were always loading, probably going to happen again. So being able to kind of recognize that is just, 
great. And it, like I said, it feels really good to be able to be, you know, play both roles for the athlete at once. It's really nice. And, and being PT ready or PT cleared is definitely not the same as being 100% game ready. So being able to say, okay, from a, from a PT, you're cleared, but from a performance coach, bro, not even close, you know, but then also being able to say, well, I know how to get you there. Or instead of kind of just referring out or just say, you're not my problem anymore. Being kind of like a, I don't know if a one-stop shop is, is the way to put it, but like that that value of being able to do both things. It's like, I've seen you through this whole rehab process. So I know where you are, you know, you're not just some uninformed coach getting this cleared kid. So have you, have you had any athletes in your, in your years doing so where you took them from, from the beginning of, of rehab to, to full game speed? So I would say that this will probably be my first year that I'll be able to, because usually it's either been I've, I've been seeing a kid um, directly after they're cleared from PT or I'm, a, I'm on a clinical and I'm seeing them when they first come in after surgery. Uh, so this will be the first year that I'll even be able to be like, hey, legally, I can do both now. Um, so that'll be it'll be an interesting and fun process. Um, I've got a few athletes who've come back from ACLs and their parents are still like, hey, that, that leg is still weak. They didn't do all the PT they needed to. Okay, well, we can still get back from that. But, um, yeah, no, no surgery to glory yet. None of those yet. Keyword. Yet, yet. yet. And, I, and I'm sure your, your future athletes, although it's, it'll be unfortunate that they're in the spot they are, are, are going to be in, in awesome hands, both physically and, and mentally. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing those stories in the future, definitely. So we got about 10 minutes or so left and so i i love the the philosophical and the theoretical and the stories and all that stuff but at the end of the day we're all practitioners and we're all trying to get better together so based on your experiences and this unique lens in which you view performance what are one to three things that the listener can do tomorrow to become better so my top three um number one is working with a purpose so um Work is just work without direction. So, you know, you need to have some kind of goal or endpoint and vision or, you know, that you're trying to pursue. Otherwise, you're just working to work. So, you know, giving a purpose to everything you do, be it the warm up, uh, different plyometrics, sprint work, power work, you know, and just giving it meaning for the athletes is just huge or even for yourself. Um, it just makes the work seem meaningful and not just like, you know, redundant um, things that you just do every day just because you have to. Uh, the second thing I would say is just to become a student of your craft. You know, um, I, I'd say that anyone who says that they know it all is very naive. And the more that you can understand about not only your role, but um, potentially other people's roles around you and how you can, you know, put best practice in play every single day. Um, I think that, again, that makes your work more meaningful. And that leads back to point one, work with a purpose. So just, just understanding what you're supposed to do. And like I said, being a student and always studying up on, you know, how can you get better each and every day is going to be pivotal, pivotal, <laughs> pivotal, in becoming a better practitioner. And then the last one I'd say is to reflect on your work frequently. So a lot of times our ego can get in the way of us ever making any meaningful changes. You know, if someone comes up and says, hey, uh, I think you're doing this wrong. It can feel almost like a threat, you know, because what you what your choices have been in training are so near and dear to you that someone coming up and trying to say that it's wrong, it just, it seems like an insult. But being able to like take a step back and objectively look and say, hey, you know, why would someone say something like that um, is, is pretty big. So if you can just take a step back without that input and just constantly reflect on, OK, this was the decision for this week. These are the, these were the results. Um, I, I really felt good about this, but maybe I don't feel so strongly about these. What can I do to make this time more meaningful? 
and just having the ability to just be humble in your decision making is huge. I think uh, as performance coach and as a healthcare practitioner. Awesome. And, and to make that a little bit more tangible, like writing that stuff down and, and whether it's your own training program or why you do what you do as a professional, like being, trying to put it down on pen and paper is, <laughs> is difficult. It's not easy to do to like truly reflect. I'm like, why, why am I here? Why do I wake up every day? Why do I say I want to be a performance coach or why am I per, a performance coach? So that's, that's kind of like the purpose, like like that, I, I've tried doing that before and like, it is definitely not easy. And then especially with, or not especially, but next with your training programs, like, you know, if, if someone were to, to come at you and just say, Hey, you know, like this might not be optimal, or I suggest X, Y, Z only having stuff kind of in the back of your head versus having stuff written down on why you have literally every single part of your program down on paper, that's going to add clarity for you. And it's going to add clarity clarity, whether it's creating content, whether it's just having conversations with other practitioners and consequently data, which is kind of, kind of what brought us together. And which is one of my favorite things in the world, but like being willing to, to collect data and like, look at those numbers and potentially say like, Hey, this isn't optimal, you know, or, and one of the beautiful things about data is like, it's either going to tell you that you're doing great, which hopefully more times than not, it would say so. But you literally have objective feedback of, of what you can get better at. And then it's you as a, as a practitioner to figure it out yourself or to have those conversations. So putting to pen and paper why you do what you do as a professional and why you do what you do in actual training and then how that can consequently lead into that 1% of, of asking what book you should read, asking those professionals, hey, can you look at my program? So I think that that's, that's definitely... A lot easier said than done coming from my own experience of just trying to trying to do that myself but it's one of those things where it's literally going to set you up for literally everything else you do yeah at um uh, at iowa once a year or maybe yeah it was like once a year um we had to have goals so we had to have x amount of goals and we go in we have a meeting about our goals uh so coach would sit down okay i see this goal how are you going to get there so not only did we have to have goals we had to have action steps to achieve those goals. So for example, um, my first goals when I showed up were make the team, make the bus, uh, compete both indoors and out slash stay healthy. Okay, well, how are you gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna get to bed at a good time. I'm gonna pay good attention to my diet. I'm gonna take care of my stresses at home and I'm gonna do my schoolwork, et cetera, et cetera. And then to wrap everything up, we'd have to sign our name to it so that it makes it official. So once you've gone over those goals, that that contract is binding. You, you're now bound to your own goals with your own signature. You're, you're committed to it, and it's on paper. You signed it, right? So um, I really like that Coach Woody did that for us, and I think that uh, that'd be something good to practice in other other professions as well. That's huge. And, and one thing that, that I found a lot of success in uh, at my recent time at TCU, it's like how often do coaches, including myself, say, oh, you have to eat right, sleep right, do all of this stuff. But it's like, how often do you tell them how to eat and sleep right? You know, if you were to have your athletes raise their hands, it's like, give me three ways you can actually sleep better. And like, no one would raise their hand. It's like, well, how often have you heard you should sleep better? And, you know, everyone raises their hand. So it's, it's giving them the, the tools to do so. And like, it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to be confidence champions. And then it's another thing to say, we're going to be confidence champions and here's how we're going to do it. So putting it down on pen and paper, kind of the, the theme of these action steps and like signing your name is like, it's one thing to say, I want X, but I want X and I know how to get there and I will make it happen. So I think that that's huge. And, and that must've been super fundamental, just clarity wise, you as an athlete and, and, uh, and it's carried over to you as a professional for sure. Without question. Awesome. So I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. I'm now opening up the floor to you to plug any of your social media, your content. The floor is yours. So my Twitter and Instagram handles are both at Brendan Thompson, but there's no O on the end of Thompson. It's just T-H-O-M-P-S-N. Um, and then I've also got Twitter and Instagram for my business, which is at BT Acceleration. It's E-X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. Um, 
been a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on here and I look forward to talking with you more in the future. Awesome. Thank you.